So, um, but good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Taylor Clem with U of IFS Extension in Alachua County. And today we're gonna to be talking all about gardening with natives here in Florida. And um, just as a reminder, only the panelists and I have the ability to have our cameras on as well as to use our microphones. Um, and that's for security purposes, but you do have the ability to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, and when you put those things in the Q&A, our master gardeners will be able to help answer those as we go along. But we'll also have time at the end that'll allow us to, um, <clears throat> we'll also have some time at the end to ask some questions and have some live feedback, etc. So um, thank you everybody for joining us. But before we get going, I want to ask everybody, what is your favorite native plant that you have in your yard or a native plant that you would like to have in your landscape? Go ahead and you can put that in the chat box. That'll be a little easier. All right. I see Kunti. And salvia, blue curls, coral bean, shoo, azaleas, oh man, our native azalea, talk about smell good, yeah, there's my cat, <laughs> oh man, y'all got some great plants, firebush, oh man, sunshine mimosa, Woo wee so we have some, we have some, oh, there's so many wonderful, beautiful native plants that you can use in your garden. And like, as I'm seeing the list of things that you all are putting in here, I'm like, we're not talking about that one. We're not gonna talk about that one. <laughs> and a lot of it is because, you know, as part of today's program, I wanna introduce us to what, you know, the resources that we have available to us. How do we define native plants? Cause that can be kind of a tricky discussion sometimes. And it really depends on who do you ask? Um, but what I want to do is, what I want to do is make sure that I introduce some of the different native plants that you can get easily. The ones that you can find at some of the, some of the, um, the nurseries that we have around here, Alachua County, around the state, and they're not going to be too difficult to find. Now, of course, you can find specific native nurseries, native plant nurseries that have way more a, a broad variety or selection of native plant materials. But I just want some with some good, strong staples that you can easily find within the landscape. And, um, you know, it's going to be a great way that we can kind of talk a little bit about everything that we have available to us. So, um, but oh man, you all put a lot in here. So, oh, someone did put that they do have audio issues. Typically, if you have an audio issue, it's gonna be associated with internet connectivity. So you might have to sign out and then sign back in if you're having an issue with that. So, all right. Wonderful. So yeah, and Kathy Patterson just put in the uh, link to the Florida Association of Native Nurseries, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. We're actually going to go to that web page. We're going to look at. Um, um, we're going to go to that web page. We're going to look at some of the plants that they have, and also look at um, the uh, Florida Native Plant Society because they have a, a really cool plant selection. Uh, um, tool for looking for native plants that are great for your area. So let me go ahead and do a share screen. Oop. All right. I'm going to try to get some stuff up so I can see it, um, but I don't want to make, I want to make sure I don't block your, your screens. So Christy or Colin, you may have to monitor the, the Q&A. And if anything pops up that I need to address, please let me know. All right. Hopefully that block's not blocking. That's not blocking your, the PowerPoint, is it? No, it's fine. It's good. OK, thank you. So um, let's go ahead and just gardening with Florida natives. So at the end of the presentation today, there's going to be a couple things that I really want us to be able to um, two big questions. I call these the essential questions. At every program I do, I like to say these are the big questions and say what is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program? Because when we start to think about plant selection and native plant selection, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program can be a great tool for you. Um, but also just like 
which native plants are commercially available in Florida? So like, what are some of those good, like I mentioned, those good native plants that we can find very easily at some of the plant nurseries available around our area, uh, but also how to find those native nurseries and the resources that we have. So um, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So it's, it's, it's ultimately it comes back to conserving water, water quality and water quantity. And a lot of it really comes from plant selection. What are the plants that we are using in the landscape to make sure that we're having a very diverse landscape? Um, one that can be attractive and colorful, it's friendly to wildlife, it's environmentally responsible and it's less work than a like a traditional landscape um, and I say kind of because it really depends on how you want to manage it and what type of specialty plants that you have so if you're a very avid gardener you might end up going out and having different specialty plants but anyways so that's a Florida friendly landscaping program but ultimately comes back to these nine different principles and these nine principles really a right plant right place water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, um, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pest, recycle, reduce stormwater, and protect the waterfront. So one of the biggest ones that we're going to really kind of focus today on today, just because of we're talking about plants and native plants, is that right plant, right place. So when you're trying to manage a landscape, you're trying to select plants for a landscape, whether it's at your home, a business, um, a local community garden, we follow the principle right plant, right place. So that just means matching those plants that thrive in those environmental conditions and um, that, sorry, matching plants that thrive in environmental conditions that you're going to plant. So with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program doesn't necessarily mean native or non-native, but what it does, but selecting native plants can, is an aspect of that if you so choose but just a matter of making sure that you're selecting the native plants that will thrive in those environmental conditions um, so if you follow right plant right place and especially if you're starting to think about some of those native plants that you can choose that have a uh, high drought tolerance um, you know they're going to be established well in the landscape so you may not ever have to fertilize them as with some a lot of our shrubs as long as they're happy in the landscape they do phenomenally well um and you know especially with our natives are going to help attract a lot of wildlife or even more diverse wildlife um and so by following right plant right place and then you try to think about oh maybe i'll go a little bit one step further and i'll select all native plants then what you start to do is you start to create a landscape that's very diverse and it attracts a lot of wildlife, it's drought tolerant, and it comes back to that protecting water quality and quantity. So um, this image on the right, um, this is Kunti. Uh, this is one of our staple uh, native plants that we use as uh, massing plants, like what I like to call them, because we'll put a lot of them together. Um, so it's just a small shrub. Um, I, oh man, I love these plants, but um, it's always just you got to be careful because it's a toxic plant. Um, if you have dogs or pets, um, the fruits on them is wildly attractive, just a beautiful, vibrant red, but it is toxic. So, um, but it is, it's a tough, tough plant in the landscape. And that's one reason we see a lot of it all over the place. <laughs> so, but why is it important that we think about the Florida Friend Landscaping Program? It's because it comes back to water use. So if we just take, you know, if we're looking at homes that have irrigation systems, um, if you have an irrigation system, we're looking at 60% of homeowner water use is attributed to that outdoor use or irrigation. That's a lot of water. Um, and I know a lot of people that do not have irrigation, which is wonderful. Um, they may just go out and just water as needed. And that's what plants are great for. You know, irrigation is good when you use it as a tool to give water to plants when it's desperately needed, not just a set it and forget it type of mentality. But it's really important that we think about plant use and plant selection because the concern of how much water is being used in some landscapes because they're being mismanaged or not managed appropriately. And really picking those plants are gonna thrive in those natural conditions. You're not really gonna have to water them or apply supplemental irrigation during periods of drought really at all because they can withstand that or they have a strong drought resistance. So um, there are a couple of things that I, I want to cover. Whoop, sorry. Um, 
there's a couple of things that I want to cover and that is like plant selection tips. So when you're looking at different plants, select plants based off environmental conditions and soil analysis. So that's that right plant, right place. If you have um, plants, <coughs> excuse me, if you have plants that prefer full sun, you know, make sure that they're going in full sun location or deep shade, make plants that you're selecting plants for deep shade conditions and think about water availability. Some plants love having moist soils while others like having dry soils. If you're on the coastal areas, because I know some, some of our participants are in St. John's County or the St. Augustine area, you're gonna have to concern, con consider the impacts of salt tolerance from, uh, you know, whether it be salt water intrusion, if you have a well, or it can just be salt spray or the ocean spray that can come up into the landscape because some plants are very, very sensitive to salt. So, um, and then the soil analysis, that's really, you know, take a soil test, do it regularly, you know, at minimum once a year, because you may have a soil that might be very acidic or you have a soil that's going to be very alkaline soil. So you're going to make sure you select plants that do well in those soil conditions. So if you have uh, an alkaline soil, of like say 7.5, which isn't too outrageous, um, you won't be able to grow things like a blueberry or some of our other really strong acid loving plants uh, because they just won't thrive in those conditions. So soil analysis is going to be very important. Um, just so you have a good understanding of your existing environmental conditions and that soil test allows us, it gives us more, um, it gives us the ability to um, understand more about our landscape than what we, we can't see our soil conditions. So that soil test gives us that information. So um, one way you can also look at like plant selection is uh, looking at ecosystems as a plant palette. You know, if you're trying to recreate an ecosystem, look at some of those local ecosystems that exist in your neighborhood or in your community. Um, but also make your uh, plant selection be goal oriented. What type of landscape or native garden do you want to have? And um, then kind of select plants to help you get you there. Are you, do you want a native pollinator habitat? Do you want a wildlife garden? Um, or a wildlife attracting landscape, you want to use a lot of pollinators for that, or do you just want it to be a aesthetically pleasing landscape? You know, that's going to attract all sorts of things, but um, think about what you want your garden to be and then, um, and then kind of make those plant selection ideas from there. But also be aware of our changing environmental conditions. Um, and a lot of that comes back to like climate, um, but also, you know, climate because, you know, Alachua County, we used to be primarily like we were split like 8B and 9A, but now we're predominantly 9A. And even years ago, it was all 8B. Um, so as we warm, plant selection might have to change. Um, but luckily, a lot of our native plants are very adaptable and they have a wide range of that hardiness zone that they like to do well in because um, they don't like too cold and they don't like too hot. Um, but also with environmental conditions, trees grow, you get more shade. So what's going to happen when your landscape starts to have more shade um, appear? So, you know, your sun loving plants might start to die out, but you might start to bring in some more shade loving plants that can then fill in those spaces. So think about how that landscape is going to continually evolve. Um, but one share that I like, I want to switch to is, let me see if I can find it. It's the the plantrealflorida.org. I really like this website. Um, let me go to the, the I can't see my, um, my headers, one moment. So this plant real Florida, I like it because um, it, wonderful. All right, you all can see that. Okay, great. So uh, what I really like is this plant communities section up here. Um, you know, when you're trying to think of what could be like ecosystems that maybe I can recreate or think about what are some of those local, those plants that do really well in my area that might be native. Um, you can, you, no matter where you live in this, in the, in the state, you can kind of come on this map and you can click here and, you know, this kind of for the hardiness zones that are 8B and it shows um, Alachua County. So say I want something that's more like a, a pine flatwoods. I can click on the pine flatwoods and then it'll show me the canopy trees, the understory trees, 
uh, the palms and shrubs, uh, and then vines and ground covers, you name it. These are all a bunch of those, the native plants that you can use that kind of mimic these different ecosystems. So if you're trying to find cool plants that can kind of go together to help build, but you're not exactly sure, like, how do I recreate this habitat? Or how do I take kind of ID what types of plants are existing? This, I really like this, this, this resource, and it's called plantrealflorida.org. So now I'll go back here. So um, let's, now that we kind of talked about that, and at the end, we'll talk about where, like sources and other resources that we have, but let's go ahead and talk about some of the native plants, like some of the fun native plants that we have. Um, but one thing I want to ask is, how do you define a native plant? Go ahead and put that in the chat box and let us know. How do you define native plants? Yeah, present. One is present in region before uh, European establishment prior to Western civilization. Yeah. Woo, y'all are filling this up. I can't keep up. Indigenous, yeah. Plant, see, and then plants that grow in this area before people. So that's a very cool designation, distinction, because that's completely different than uh, European settlers and European influences. <laughs> I like this, whatever the experts tell, is, uh, tell me is a native. <laughs> Yeah. Plants that grow here naturally. So there's a lot of really great idea, um, really great ideas. And really the definition of native plants changes, you know, uh, not necessarily changes, but can be defined in different ways. Um, you know, like University of Florida, we don't necessarily say this is what a native plant is, but we do have kind of descriptions of um, what they are. We do have one EDIS publication, and a, we actually have a state statute that um, defines what a, a native plant is. Um, and let me see. So it's on this document that I just pulled up for you all. And uh, we'll share this with you all on email afterwards. Um, but just an overview of native plants. And I really like, like, what is a native plant? So you can see that federally we have uh, designations. Um, in Florida, we have a state statue, but you can see the state statue uh, right here says a plant species that is presumed to have been pre present in Florida before European contact. So like the Florida Native Plant Society, the second one here, said for most purposes, the phrase Florida Native Plant refers to those species occurring within the state boundaries prior to European contact, according to the best available scientific and historical documentation. More specifically, includes these species understood as indigenous, occurring in natural associations and habitats that existed prior to significant human impacts and alterations of the landscape. So, um, you can see that the definition is, you know, generally looked at as prior to European contact, but there is some people that will argue that it's before human contact. But then like some of the, um, just because plants ch shifted around as humans migrated around um, or as like maybe different trading, but um, one of the, one of the big things and when we're talking about like what native plants are, we just generally take the accepted as prior to European contact. But like the uh, Florida Native Plant Society definition says, it's really hard because uh, it's really hard to really understand which ones are completely because, you know, that scientific and historic documentation can be tough uh, to really kind of say what existed here, what did not exist. So, uh, but anyways, so that's what kind of native plants are. Um, and so let's go ahead and just jump into different types. Um, some of these we don't, you're probably going to say like, oh, why didn't we have, talk about this one, this one. I, you know, I kind of picked some of the like 
some that I, I really like, and um, I, maybe I'd like to see more, but you can, you can still find pretty easily. Um, so it's very subjective, of course. But at the end, if you have any questions about native plants, we can also take those at that time. So let's talk about ground covers. Ooh, I love this one. So, um, but we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, so we'll go through the ground covers first. This, obviously, I think this is one of uh, everybody's favorites, which is the sunshine mimosa. So the sunshine mimosa, uh, you got to be very careful on which one you pick because there is an invasive mimosa that looks very similar to this. It's just taller, essentially. Um, so making sure that you go to a reputable uh, nursery to get the selection is going to be very important. But it's very adaptable throughout the state, and it prefers that full sun, the part shade conditions, and it really likes well-drained to medium-drained soils. Um, has very high drought tolerance, and um, it's about six inches high, but like if you put it out in your lawn, you can mow it if you're mowing regularly. Um, it takes a beating like that, and it's fine. Um, it is sensitive to foot traffic. Um, so maybe if you have a lawn area that might not have, if you have a bunch of people walking around on all the time, I wouldn't recommend it. But if you have a lawn area that you would like to bring in some more diversity, you can bring these in. Um, but during our cooler time of the year, they do thin out a little, but they kind of like pop right back up. Um, but they do like occasional moisture. And another thing with these is, um, to kind of get them going, they do prefer a lot of water. It can get them a lot of water before they start uh, really kicking butt because they do like they do like moisture, but they need that well-drained soil. So, um, and another awesome thing about the mimosa is that they're touch sensitive. So you can touch them and you see the leaves just like whoop, fold up. Um, how many of you, do any of you use this um, within your landscapes or have you seen it around? Yeah, easements. You'll see it a lot in like right away, right away easements. Um, yeah, and like Depot Park, Morningside. It's we'll see it in yeah the right of ways um, all over my yard. Wonderful. Yeah, I mean these are these are great adaptable plants. They're tough. Um, I I love them. So. <laughs> um, one person said that they're. Um, their daughter calls it coronavirus plant. I've I've seen similar people call like the button bush, same thing. Yeah, so yeah, so a lot of the things that people are mentioning like parking lots, right of ways. The reason that they're put there is because they're easy to maintain. Um, so it's like, oh man, a drought tolerant plant that I don't have to mess with much. That's why they're very, they're, they're used quite regularly in some of those low maintenance areas. So sunshine mimosa is a wonderful, wonderful plant. Um, so, um, Christy, yes, I'm unable to see the chat box because it keeps closing on me. Understood. Yeah. Understood. Well, just as you're moving along through different plants, uh, we have been asked, uh, if you can address any of the ones that are deer resistant, uh, as mm. you go through them, if you can make note of that, if you're able to. Okay. Yeah. I may not have all of it off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll try my best. So. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. So I, hey, look, I this is Col Colin. Yeah, Colin. The other thing is to differentiate this from the mimosa, the, the silk, the Persian silk tree, which is really invasive and all over and has the same dispersion method of, as these, as, as this ground cover. Yes. Yeah. There's, um, and that's why making sure that you're getting this from a really reputable dealer, because sometimes if you're buying it in a one gallon container, you can't tell the difference between the native and the invasive. So coming from a reputable dealer is going to be very, very important. And if it suddenly appears and grows into a tree in your, in your <laughs> Cut garden, <it> down. <laughs> get busy with the chainsaw. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, so that's the nice thing is like these sunshine mimosas, they're going to stay very, very low. Um, and like, I can't remember the specific, the Latin name of the other ground cover invasive, but it stays, um, it stays nice and low, but it's going to get about 12 to 18 inches tall 
Um, so it does stand out a little bit more. It's a little bit harder for ID. So this one, how many of you seen this one? This is, oh, I love this. So this is, this is Turkey Tangle. So Turkey Tangle is a great, or like Phyla nutiflora, nutiflora, um, great ground cover, very adaptable throughout a, a lot of the state, that 8B uh, to 10. So 8B, you might not be able to do it out like the um, far panhandle area. Um, but here in Alachua County, it does wonderful. Uh, full sun, the part shade. Um, and again, similar to the, um, the sunshine mimosa, you can interplant this in your lawn and you can mow it. You can let it just kind of grow. Um, oh, I had the wrong size on there. <laughs> it's one, it's more, it's very similar to the other. It's about three inches to six inches tall, um, but it spreads considerably. So, but usually like to plant a lot of it to help it fill in pretty quickly. Um, so it's a great native ground cover. It's a larval food. And when you mow it, it improves its overall health. But it kind of creates these little white flowers. If you're familiar with like white clover, um, like I know up north in cooler climates, the white clover sometimes is considered a warm season weed, which I, I don't consider it that. Um, it's a great forage for livestock, but this kind of is like the warm season um, equivalent of white clover because of the form and texture and the flowers. But these are beautiful, wonderful plants that you can easily intermix within your landscape. Taylor, we had a question with mm -hmm. regard to deer resistance for this mm -hmm. particular specimen. So I, I'm not sure how resistant these are, but it's because of how low growing they are, I can't imagine deer really targeting them out too much, especially if they're intermixed, because it'd just be more of like a grazing um, compared to some of like hibiscus where a deer will come and they'll chew that thing down to a nub. So, um, but usually in like, if you're using it as a ground cover within the lawn, it's not gonna be too big of an issue, so. Next is the uh, Tampa vervain or verbena. These um, are a little bit taller there, but they can get about two feet tall, but I like to treat them as ground covers because you can put them as a really nice mass. Um, they like the um, full sun, well-drained soils. They have a very high drought tolerance. These, from what I do understand, can have an issue with deer, um, but um, not too terribly bad. Sometimes that what I like to do when I have plants or what I recommend, um, if we if you have a large property where you do have a deer issue, sometimes I put the plants that they do like off far away. So it's almost like a trap crop for them. So rather than coming to the high ornamental, I put some plants out far away that that takes them there versus coming uh, to the garden. So, but Tampa vervain or verbena. So I, the, the purple is like this lavender light pink, sorry, light purple color. Um, again, it's larval food for a lot of our, for a lot of our pollinators or sorry, for uh, butterflies. So high drought tolerant, beautiful plant. I love putting this as big, big masses um, because like once you put it in a big mass, it can fill up a really um, a nice ground cover area that then you can put some taller shrubs kind of behind it. So it kind of creates a really nice layering effect uh, with the plant material. Ooh, and here's a staple. So um, the tick seed. Um, so tick seed, you know, this is kind of more of like uh, an annual self seeding annual, but I love using, recommend using it as kind of like a ground cover and just intermixing it. Um, you know, it can grow throughout the state, full sun to part sun, well-drained soils, um, medium high drought tolerance and, um, you know, but it's, it is short lived. Um, but, you know, if you start looking out around the, the, the area right now, a lot of our Coreopsis or the tick seed is starting to bloom. Um, Kathy, you, do you have your tick seed blooming on, at your uh, property? Yes, the Coreopsis lanceolata is blooming. The Leavenworthy eye will take a few more months, but I've been through Gainesville on, you know, that place on 16th Avenue where it's blooming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not too far off 13th Street and there's places blooming out by the interstate on Archer Road in 75. They've done an amazing job in some of the roadways. Yeah, the, those right of way areas are great for pollinators and um, 
Um, Jarrett Daniels, Dr. Jarrett Daniels at the University of Florida has a really cool project called the Pollinator Highway that works a lot with like pollinators and roadways and using those wildflowers. Um, and one of our local partners is the Gainesville Garden Club. They're the ones that uh, maintain that uh, Coreopsis bed on 16th. And so, there's another new one on 43rd Street op opposite the library that is in full flower right now. It's oh, just wonderful. amazing. It makes across so much from, difference from those trees that used to be uh, uh, running out of control. You're talking about the one across from Millhopper Library? Millhopper Library on Northwest 43rd Street. Yeah. A massive so, yellow. It's beautiful. This is, this is a beautiful time of year because we're starting to see a lot of those uh, wildflowers start to bloom and it just, it's gorgeous. And one of the nice things is being able to work with like FDOT or some of our other local municipalities um, and governments to look at right-of-ways as being a great place to plant some of these wildflowers such as the tick seed um, or the coreopsis. But, um, oh my gosh, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. And we do have a program um, that we do about wildflower gardens where you learn all about uh, sowing the seed and establishment. So, but tick seed, beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous plants. I wish we had them everywhere. <laughs> so let's go ahead and talk about some annuals and perennial plants that uh, we can see. So this one is a twin flower. Um, it's a nice little grow, low growing, can you get two to three feet tall, um, but it, it is fast growing and it has these showy uh, purple flowers. And it's called a twin flower because on uh, like some, a little bit of the older growth, not at the tips, like you see some terminal buds, but the has two flowers that kind of just pop out. Um, from the same node and that's how kind of how it gets its name. Um, there's a lot of plants that go by twin flower though so that's why it's important to really look at that Latin name or that scientific name uh, just because common names are there's no rhyme or reason why they're really called that um, rather than just a colloquial term that's used but the scientific name is based off of uh, like the botany and um, taxonomy. So um, always when you're looking for specific plants, that Latin name is going to be very, very important. Um, but these guys really like full sun, the part shade, um, well-drained soils. Um, they have a moderate drought tolerance, um, but they're really nice because you're putting in as a perennial, they fill in and they can uh, take up some space really quickly because of how quickly growing they are. And that can be really nice, especially if you start thinking about some of the warm season weeds that might pop up in our gardens, um, they can help outcompete them a little bit. Blue curls, I think someone mentioned this earlier that they are interested in growing blue curls or they do have blue curls in their landscape. Oh man, so I just think these, it's a very fine texture native plant, um, you know, likes full sun, but it's self seeding, which is really, really cool. So you can kind of get it coming back or you can collect some of the seeds and help propagate it. Um, it's fragrant and attracts, wild, it attracts many pollinators, um, but my goodness, the flower. I just love the flowers. Um, I think, I mean, how the, I, I want to know, I can't, I don't know about this one, but so many different flowers evolve in very specific ways for specific pollinators. So, you know, seeing that unique flower form, I, I would love to know specific, like how did this plant evolve into what type of pollinator and why does it form that way? So, um, but the forked, the forked blue curls, beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, you know, in a, you can bring it in as a pop of annual or perennial, put it in a great container. Um, I really like it if you're in like a natural setting, you know, that very fine texture is really cool to have within a natural setting and um, putting it in like clumps or access, accent plants um, as massing is wonderful. And then, of course, we have to have the salvia, uh, the scarlet sage or the salvia cosinea. Um, these, like, they'll, they'll attract everything. <laughs> a, a couple, um, they'll attract everything. So a couple of years ago, we sell these at our annual Master Gardener Volunteer Plant Sale. And, you know, as people are walking around the plant sale, picking up all their plants, including the salvias, you know, if you stand back and watch, you're seeing like pollinators like dive bombing into all the salvia and um, 
enjoying them before they all uh, disappeared. But um, the, the wonderful pollinator plants, they attract so many wildlife. They're really great because what they do is they can get a little bit tall, but they're nice clumping upright form. They do like that full sun condition. Like you, once they're in the ground and they're hardened off a little bit, they can take a lot of sun throughout the day, um, but they do well in that part shade as well. But we can grow these all throughout the state. And there's a lot of different salvias that you can get. Not all of them are going to be native, but this is one of our natives that we can use. Um, and I, I really recommend using this one. They're easy. They self-seed pretty easily. Um, you can propagate them um, and you can grow and put them in a big mass. Great, great plant. Um, and just that red, that's a bright, bright red. <laughs> kind of just like jumps out at you. So. And I love these. I love, I love these. These are like, you know, little spring presents after a rain. Um, rain lilies are beautiful uh, perennials, annuals, but um, they're usually going to keep coming back. So usually what I recommend is if you plant rain lilies, put them in spaces around other massing plants and they do great in shade too. So they're known because you know, we get the rain that like a say a spring rain come in and they'll bloom shortly after those spring rains. Uh, they're very short lived, which is kind of the downside of them, but they add, you know, they're beautiful within the landscape. Um, they nice, they grow in nice little clumps, but they ebb and flow throughout the year. So there'll be a lot of downtime that they're not going to be there, but then they'll pop up and be gorgeous. So plan around them. So when they're not there, it doesn't look like you have empty space in your garden, but they do like moist soils to occasionally wet soils. Um, so you can't just like put them out in uh, very dry, super dry conditions, but rain lilies, beautiful plants. Many of us, like me, I love them. Um, they pop up in my yard. <laughs> So, um, I, I, you know, so like randomly, I'll uh, get ready to go outside and do landscaping and then um, I see one whoop, that's popped up. So if I go to mow, I mow around it. <laughs> I let it stand and hang out for a little bit. Um, but rain lily, beautiful, beautiful plants. So we'll go ahead and now and we'll jump into shrubs. So uh, there's so many different shrubs that we could talk about, but you know, Hamelia patens, the firebush, this is, I think, a standard. They can get pretty tall. Now, there are some dwarf cultivars that are available, but if you're talking about what is the, the native uh, firebush, it's going to be these, these taller ones. Um, they do, and they, the nice thing is because of the color, they're really great attractors for pollinators, and they do well in that part shade, the shadier conditions. They're not going to be tolerant or too tolerant of full sun. Um, so when you, if you have a shadier part of your landscape, this is a great way to add some really good color to your landscape. That's awesome at attracting wildlife and different pollinators. Um, but once they're established, they're, they are hands off. They are tough as nails. Um, beautiful, wonderful plants. So this is one that we don't see too often in a landscape, but it is still one of my favorites. It's the, the salt bush. So this is a dioecious plant. So uh, by dioecious, it means it's like two houses. There is a male plant and there's a female plant. Um, the one I really like to plant is the female, um, just because it's going to have this very vibrant white, like what you see on the left, um, that's the female these vibrant white flowers. Um, the males are attractive too, but um, they, these are rather inconspicuous. You don't see them that much. They pop up all over our natural landscapes. Um, and you can actually find these all the way up in the Canada. They're, they're very abundant. Um, so they like that full sun, the part shade. They like, um, they like more moist soils. They can do well in dry, but they can't go really long periods of uh, very dry soil. So it has a low drought tolerance, but they can get kind of big. But if you prune, and they don't have um, a very strong form, they can look weedy or leggy, but you can actually prune them to help promote growth and it can improve that form and structure of the salt butch. Um, 
So this one can be pretty deer resistant. Um, I haven't heard too much of an issues about, about this one. Um, and one of the neatest things that I really like is it is um, a pollinator magnet you put these in and once they're blooming, you can find all sorts of pollinators um, visiting the shrub and create, it's like its own little ecosystem that it creates. So the salt bush, the, I wish we had more of them, <laughs> but they're not typically planted in like a residential setting. Um, yes, Kathy. There's a ton of them over at Sweetwater Wetlands Park. Yes. You can see them there when they're in bloom. Yeah, do you have any on your property? No, we don't have any. Yeah, so they're not typically planted in such a way like ornamentally, but I'm like, why are we, why are we not using them? <laughs> I think it's just because they do take a little of that pruning to help improve the structure and form. Otherwise they can look a little weedy, but I love these plants. But yeah, Kathy said, Kathy said if you're over at uh, Sweetwater Wetlands, um, you can go see them there. Um, and you can just see the the dance of pollinators that's happening all around it. So there was one time I was with a bunch of extension agents. We were at Austin Carey Forest, um, you know, on the north side, at northeast side of Gainesville. And we were all standing on a patio of the conference center there and there was a salt bush in bloom. And you could tell that we we're all a bunch of extension agents because we're all like, you know, just inches from the bush, just looking at it or the shrub, this was pre-COVID. And just watching all the pollinators just moving from the different flowers, it was, a sight to behold. So I love these guys. So this is one of those plants that if you're okay with the weedy nature of it, plant it. It'll do wonderful. If you do want to use it more ornamentally and try to get it to look more full, you would have to do some pruning and structure just to help it out a little bit, but it's not going to impact the health of it. So coral bean. Um, Coral bean, yeah, be careful with deer on this one. <laughs> they do, they can munch on it, um, but I really like it because, I mean, the flowers. The flowers are the showstoppers for it. They they can do well in full sun to part shade. I've seen them do okay in some very shady conditions. Um, they don't look too as good. Um, I think the um, the wild no. No, I'm thinking of the wrong plant. I apologize. So I was trying to think of the deep shade alternative. Um, but they do like well-drained soils. They're really tough plants. Um, they're high drought tolerance. They can get kind of big, um, but they have a very unique like trident leaf shape. Um, you can see in the image on the right, um, or the leaflets are kind of like that trident shape. And so just like the, the form, it's kind of like an arching sprawling. It's not like a round form that you think of some shrubs. Um, and it just explodes with these vibrant red flowers. And you will see um, all sorts of uh, pollinators that, uh, are attracted to it. So um, what I like to do is interplant these with other things because they can kind of come and go depending on conditions. They are very prickly. So you don't yeah. want them where kids are going to reach them. They can get thorns in them. Yeah. So use them for their visual quality. Um, but thank you. That's a great recommendation. So I love these plants. Of course, I said that I think, I think about every plant that we're talking about. <laughs> the coral bean. Um, blue stem palmetto. I wish we had more of these. Um, you know, the, the, all the palmettos, not just the blue stem. Um, you know, we have multiple native uh, species of the palmettos that we can use. But one thing that I really like about the blue stem is sometimes you can get that like blue hue to them. So it's a very nice little contrast with some of like this, the, the other palmettos. Now this is a, a great alternative to like the saw palmetto because we're talking about the prickly mesh of the coral bean, you know, saw palmetto, oof, you gotta be careful around those because they can, their petioles on the leaves are pretty sharp. So um, the blue stem palmetto is a really nice alternative that you can use. Um, it's a great, um, massing palmetto has a very you know traditional great Florida naturalistic look they're very easy to maintain and you can use them in very natural settings or you can use them in ornamental settings and they look great um, and they can get you know about five feet tall or four feet tall and five feet wide um, they do they're very they can be they are slow growing very high drought tolerance and they prefer that part shade and the part shade if you think about it in those natural conditions they're typically going to be within those oak hammocks or those pine uh the pine flatwoods where they're going to be dappled sunlight that's uh throughout the landscape um, but these are great and you won't have to worry about deer with them 
So, and you can get these pretty easily um, from a lot of our, our nurseries. So let's go ahead and talk about trees. Um, and I like that one in there. So, but uh, Yopon Holly. Yopon Holly, uh, this, you know, I feel like these are getting more popular now, but I don't know. Maybe it's just how I'm just interpreting it. But um, the Yopon Holly, <laughs> you know, just the story and the use of Yopon holly is just phenomenal. You know, I think our, our state tree is the cabbage palm, but sometimes I'm like, why not the Yopon holly? Um, we see it throughout the northern part of the state. Um, it's not like your tradition, it is a holly, but it's not gonna have like those prickly leaves. It has very small leaves and they have more, uh, they don't have the, the spines on the little prickles along the margin, but they like full sun, well-drained soils. They have incredibly high drought tolerance and they create these beautiful, beautiful uh, trees. And I mean, just the, I mean, obviously they're not the size of like live oaks or anything like that, but like 20 feet by 20 feet, a nice just canopy that's great for a yard if you have the space for it. Um, they do create these little inconspicuous flowers, uh, the white flowers, and they will have the red berries like all all hollies do. But one of the really neat things is the ethnobotanical use of these. Um, a lot of uh, indigenous tribes would use um, would use the leaves of these to create different teas. Um, and um, if I'm re remembering correctly, a lot of like the ritual, a lot of ritual drinks that were used with a bunch of different Native American tribes uh, throughout the South the throughout the southeast used this in uh, ceremonies and different rituals and it was commonly referred to as black drink because they would steep it just like a tea and then they would use it um, and they would drink it for whatever the ceremony might be but um, and the story was that the caffeine levels are in it are so high that it would make you vomit. That's how it ends up with the, the name Ilex vomitoria, but it doesn't do that. It doesn't make you vomit, but it does have high caffeine levels. So we actually, you can go to the store and you can now buy this um, in the store as a tea um, in a lot of different local stores around here in Alachua County and elsewhere. But um, this is just a really great tree that has a cool story, a history uh, built in Florida, and it's a wonderful native plant. Um, there are a bunch of different cultivars that are available for it. Um, again, sometimes people don't consider the cultivars um, as the native plants um, since they were kind of manip in some cases they're manipulated to have those specific characteristics. But anyways, um, there are some forms of this that you can get. The low cultivar is called the Nana Holly. It's more like a shrub. Um, there's a weeping form. It's the, the uh, Pendula. Um, the weeping upon holly is the Ilex vomitoria pendula. There's one that just looks like a pencil, and that's a Will Fleming, or the columnar. So there's different forms that are available uh, to you that can fit your landscape needs. But using it as a tree, that's to me is the most ideal. Taylor, my yopon is in flower right now, and the mass of pollinators that are uh, assimilating around this. This tree, it's, it's, it's transient, of course. But <laughs> I, I lost count of the insects and moths that were there uh, mm -hmm. in the last few days. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's a, is yours full grown? Do you have the, the tree or do you have one of the other cultivars? I have a tree. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, I think it's a tree. It's, got, it's growing <laughs> that way. <laughs> it was planted uh in 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 a space uh that was opened up with a tree and a, an oak i lost after the uh, hurricane but it's mm -hmm. about 20 foot tall already so oh, I okay so great. yeah that is more than likely that is the uh <laughs> that's the the native form of it the just the vomitoria um because the weeping has a very pronounced weeping form but it gets about 15 20 feet tall the columnar is i mean it's very obvious that's a columnar <laughs> form it's just straight up shot it's um kind of like those italian cypress that same type of form but doesn't get as tall so you probably have the tree um which is wonderful i, I these are great plants so plant more of these 
<laughs> um, sparkleberry. So this is like our native blueberry. Um, so the or the farkleberry, it's a vaccinium arboreum. Now in southern parts of Florida, like once you start to get south of Ocala, like the uh, Orlando area and south, it may not grow very well, but it's going to prefer that full sun to part shade and it, it can have like a form of a very large shrub but you can prune it up into a tree form and that's kind of typically the most ideal um but has very high drought tolerance has well-drained soils um but it can, it's it's not as big as the the yopon but it's about 15 feet tall 10 feet wide but um, it has edible fruits, doesn't taste like a blueberry, doesn't look like a blueberry, uh, but they do have edible fruits. Um, and it's a major wildlife attractor. But my favorite part is the flowers, of course. So um, kind of just like droop whoop, and just hang there. Um, but great, great plants. So, and also it's fun to say Farkleberry. <laughs> Any of you have this one in your landscape or have seen this one around? So, yeah, I do. You have I didn't know I did. Uh, well, I didn't know I did until uh, maybe a week ago, week or two ago when it started blooming. Uh, previous owners had chopped it down. It had mm -hmm. started growing back as a bush uh, ah. and I refused to cut it back because I didn't know what it was yet. So I finally figured out what it is and I've got it in a small three foot bush mound at the moment, but oh, it's wonderful. doing quite nicely. Wonderful. Now, just like the others, vacciniums, like our blueberries, they do like a more acidic soil. So, um, mm. but yeah, let that thing grow. <laughs> so, I plan on it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially now that I know what it is. I'm like, oh, it's supposed to be here. That's oh, right. great. <laughs> yeah. So wonderful. Yeah. Beautiful. Hey, Christy, give me a cutting or two, please. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Of course. I'm sure we can work something out. <laughs> <laughs> so handing out and propagating plants. Um, uh, winged elm, so winged elm, it's a, you know, these, sometimes people don't like them too much because they can look a little, you know, the, the branches just can, there's could be a bunch of them and it, some people might think it looks a little messy, but uh, the winged elm or the almasalata is one of our native elms or it is our native elm. Um, full sun, part shade, it can get taller. Um, and you get taller than 20 feet. That's kind of just average um, or that's minimum. Uh, but a nice thing is they actually have medium to high wind resistance. So if we compare this to like the drake elm that's commonly planted, drake elm is our non-native and it's a, a great tough tree, but has very low wind resistance and compared to our native elm that um, that has a high wind resistance and a lot of it is because that the the winged elm um i mean if you think about evolutionary our storms it's that's probably one one reason why it has a much stronger wood than the drake elm um but what really stands out about these winged elms is the what you see on the new growth it eventually falls off um but you can see it on the image above the the branches form these like corky little wings so, I mean, it's such a unique characteristic of plants. And from my understanding, we don't know why it does that, um, but it's definitely really, really cool. Uh, like why in its genetics has it developed that characteristic? Um, so that's a unique characteristic of that plant. So when you get in looking at it, it's like no other plant uh, around here will have that. So, um, but the winged elm, great tree for your landscape, very adaptable throughout the state, um, very high drought tolerance. Once it's established, you know, you don't really have to touch it. And I know because the sometimes people think that the branching can kind of look a little ugly because it's just a bunch of it. It might seem thin. You can do selective pruning to kind of help with the structure of it. Um, but at that, like I said, it's selective pruning. So only you're not going to go out and prune a bunch. It's just a little bit to kind of take away some messy parts of like branches are crossing, rubbing one against one another. So um, those are things you got to look out for. Red buckeye. So we're on the southern limit of red buckeye. So you know, even in Alachua County, they're iffy on how well they, they can do, but beautiful part shade trees um, and they like well-drained soils, beautiful showy flowers. They do have um, very toxic seeds. 
Um, now the the dessert Buckeye, which is peanut butter dipped in chocolate, is absolutely de delicious. But this um, these these are very toxic seeds. Um, but the nice thing is, if you live in an area that has intermittent flooding. Um, these actually do really well and it survives that extended flooding, those flooding periods. So you'll see a lot of these planted along like around floodplain edges or stuff like that uh, because they can do well with the inundation that they can periodically get. But a buckeye, you know, again, similar to the coral bean, has that beautiful uh, red flower. And um, a lot of our coral bean, I sorry, a lot of our buckeyes are flowering right now. And once you have, once you're able to get a buckeye in your landscape, you're gonna have a lot of little seedlings start to pop up. To, so you can easily, uh, not as easily, but you can, um, with some practice, dig them up and you can transplant them and grow them in other places as well. So um, we used to have, we had one at our old extension office and once a little sprout would pop up, it would not be uncommon to see one of our volunteers or one of our other extension agents outside digging up the little ones so they could take it home. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I did want to mention some of our grasses because we've got some great grasses and we have some great uh, vines, which I'll show you in the next. And I just want to give you kind of a good list of ones that you can easily find. Um, the most common ones of our native grasses are the Fakahatchee and muley grass. Fakahatchee grass I love because you can put it in nice for like strong tough clumps and um, you don't have to do much to it. Now you can cut it back every once in a while. It has thicker blades, um, leaves. Um, and the muley grass, um, you usually have to cut it back once a year or every other year, just a few, like about three to six inches above the ground, um, just to help promote that growth. But one of the nice things about the muley grass is like you can see in this picture is when it's flowering, woo, that's beautiful. I found this um, just on Pinterest and um, this was actually taken at Anastasia Island. So, which is uh, over in St. Augustine, right, right along the beach. So another one is Elliot switchgrass and Elliot's love grass. Those are great, great grasses that you can use within a landscape. Um, so in some vines, uh, the railroad vine, um, you know, that's a, that's a great native vine that you can use, especially if you have really well-drained soil, sandy conditions. Um, but be, uh, make sure that it's labeled properly because the Ipomoea, we got, I mean, that's a uh, genus of plants where we have hundreds of species within it um, and a lot of which are highly invasive. So just make sure that you're selecting the, the, the correct one. Passion flower, I mean, it doesn't get any much better than a passion flower. This, this passion flower is actually from uh, one of our Master Gardener volunteers. It's just in their backyard glowing up on their fence, um, Mary Ann Harris, but it's a beautiful, beautiful um, climbing vine. Um, some other ones are like our cross vine and of course coral honeysuckle. So passion flower can be tough to get going but once you get it it has a good strong root system it will it'll go crazy and in, in a good way. <laughs> so um, and the next obviously we're talking about um, we're talking about native plants, but anytime you're looking for plants, always check out our assessment page, our IFAS assessment page, to kind of double check that some of the plants, if you want to pick, aren't considered invasive, because you can still go to our nurseries and find plants that are considered invasive. Um, so just double check. Those are the no-no plants, like the Mexican petunia. And petunia is a very common uh, um, invasive plant that we have. So the IFAS assessment page is, important, is a great resource. So, um, and then lastly, I want to show you uh, these, um, a couple of these links. So we have the Florida Friendly Landscape Selection Guide. That's just an online application where it's, you know, you can select for native plants, but also your growing conditions. And it'll pull up all the plants that are a lot of plants that do really well in your area. But the Florida Native Plant Society has a major, an amazing plant selection guide as well for native plants. Um, and the, that plant, Real Florida, that ha, that one that I showed you, the environmental, like, sorry, the ecosystems, that's another great resource that you can go to for plant selection. Um, but it's also important to select plants from reputable sources. Some of the plants that 
we you can buy you it's really important to know where you're getting the source of the native plants because a lot of issues that we do have with native plants in the landscape is that they are they have the term what's called commercially exploited so it means that they're collected from our natural um, populations and they're brought into the commercial so we're losing them within those natural ecosystems where they're needed and being brought into like residential ornamental areas so they're called commercially exploited plants um, and one example of those commercially exploited advanced plants are kunti so making sure that like the plants that you're getting even if they're very common like a kunti that you know is coming from a wholesale nursery that's propagating them and you know where those how those plants are coming into their inventory for sale um, if someone's unable to really answer you those answer that question and know the source of the plants you may want to avoid purchasing it from them um, but really making sure that you're getting it from a reputable dealer is going to be very, very important. I really like on the Florida Native Nurseries, that fan.org, they actually have kind of like a uh, native plant nursery directory. So you can kind of see what are some of the native nurseries that are around the area um, that you can go to. Now we have some here in Alachua County. Um, that you can go to. Um, some are specialized, but um, you know we have a list of them in our office, and I can send those out. But that fan website is a really is is a good one for that uh, nursery locator. So by now, um, oh, that's an old thing. But um, anyways, so we should have been able to answer those essential questions. What's the floor friendly landscaping program? What are some of the good commercially available plants that you can get that are native? Um, but with regards to the IFAS extension, um, we used to be over by the airport. That building was shut down. We're in a temporary office in Jonesville. Um, we're close to Sun Country Sports, if you're familiar with that, where that is. Um, and our new office, which will be opening up uh, the latter half of the summer, um, is out in Newberry at the Canterbury Equine Facility. Um, but you can reach out to me um, or any of our other extension agents um, and at the UFIFAS Extension Alachua County's office if you have any questions. Um, and again, we'll follow up with any of the stuff that we have here um, that we talked about today, just so we can make sure that resource is available to you. So um, thank you. And I think I don't have a question slide. So that's it. So we can now Taylor, open it up for I questions. I do have a couple, <laughs> of course. We do have a couple of loose questions that I couldn't quite interrupt on. So yeah. uh, it, maybe we can take care of those real quick. Absolutely. If possible. Absolutely. Um, one, in, one in particular, uh, I'll just start at the top. There's three here. Um, what is the problem with cultivated non-native coonties? I think you made some reference earlier, but no so, detail. What is the problem with cultivated non-native Kuntis? So, or is um, there an issue with it? I think um, so. There are some zamias that aren't the Kunti that are invasive and non-native, um, like a cardboard plant. I think is one I have to double check. Um, okay. So you need that you want the specific. I know it wasn't in the list, but the um, the the the, the, the scientific name has changed for Kunti. It used to be just Zamia floridana, um, and I think it's now Zamia interfolia. So as long as it's that specific species of Kunti, um, it's still considered native. It's just cultivated and it's brought from a safe source. Um, it's cultivated within like wholesale nurseries and it's still considered native. But within that genus of Zamia, there are invasive species. Um, so it's just like the mimosa, you know, that mimosa strigulosa that we talked about at the very beginning. There are right. invasive counterparts to it that are within that same genus that you just gotta be careful with. Hopefully it answers the question well. Okay. 
Hope so. Well, at least it's the right direction. Um, okay. And let's see, Suzanne Goldtrap, she wanted to, and we, I did see a few comments uh, about the Tampa area. Was there anything in your presentation that, that uh, some of our, our Tampa residents would exclude or uh, it, this particular question, she's wanting more bees for her veg and flower garden. So um, I believe like you'll get this copy. So you'll see like view the hardiness zones. That's going to be your biggest indicator. So like obviously the the, the Buckeye will not grow well uh, in Tampa um, because I, I can't remember what hardiness zone Tampa is. It's either 9B or 10A. Um, so use that as your indicator to, for climate purposes to determine which ones will do well. But like the salvia, that's going to grow well. Um, some of those other ground covers towards the beginning that we were talking about are going to do great. Um, let me go back to that one. So like your fire bush will do well. Um, so use that hardiness zone to be that good indicator. So like, yeah, the scarlet sage will do great. And that's great around. It's very compact. You can put it in containers. And um, it's hard to see the context, but this is actually next to a veggie garden. And that is to attract pollinators to help with uh, fruiting of a lot of those vegetables. So like the forked blue curls, you know, if you want to bring that around your garden, that would be right. great as well. So yeah. Good deal. Okay, and let's see here. A uh, young lady here is talking about having some awesome live oaks, but it provides heavy shade. And that means her, the ground is pretty much a dust bowl during the summer. Suggestions for a ground cover that could handle that type of shade. Also woodland plants that would be happy under oaks. So um, yeah, it, one native, I have to double check. I can't think. The oak leaf hydrangea. That's a native hydrangea, I believe. Um, so that one will actually do really well. Um, you actually see a lot of hydrangeas underneath oak trees and they do great. Um, but yeah, that, that's problematic with a lot of our large canopy trees is trying to get things that do well underneath them because of it's a very mass or vast root system. So you're kind of like trying to pocket things in where you can. Um, yeah. But a lot of our very shallow rooting uh, plants are going to be your best. Um, but usually in like those big situations like that, depending on the size and how much space, I like to let them say as uh, just, um, um, what do you want to call it? Uh, self mulching, kind of just like leaf litter bed underneath it. And you kind of, you can put some plants that kind of gain interest or grab attention on it. Or sometimes you can plant kind of around that canopy drip edge and um, use that to kind of define a bed. And then you kind of create a border um, a little into the canopy of the tree or uh, mm -hmm. like the backdrop of a planting bed. So it could be like your larger shrubs. So then you can have open space behind it, but you don't see it because you have um, a wide planting bed that kind of follows the curve of the drip line of the oak tree. So um, that's a very good image that if I could draw it and show it, <laughs> <laughs> that would look really nice, but um, ground covers can be tough to get those, get them in there. Um, but nonetheless, any of any of our uh, shade loving ground covers, um, are, as long as you can get them planted in there and let them spread, that's going to be the best. So a lot of people will use like Asiatic jasmine in conditions like that, but they're not native plants. So right. So excluded from this 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 discussion. <laughs> Understood. Okay, well, uh, do we have any native plants that can penetrate the hard pan in a, in a landscape? Uh, or do you just kind of have to break it up uh, in, in order to get any planting done if desired? So in that condition, if there is a hard pan, I'm just, I'm in my mind, I'm imagining that it is not draining too well and it's has more moisture. I would recommend just selecting plants that do well in that that soil that needs the plants that need a little bit of extra moisture versus the well-drained soils. Um, so like a great example of the shady condition, that's where you could put in something like the the buckeye because it can do well in those those uh, moist conditions or like you know rain lilies, of course. Um, but uh, like the salt bush, 
that's one that does well in those moist conditions. So maybe in that situation, rather than thinking about breaking through the hard pan or trying to till it and mix it and break it up, because in some situations, our hard pan can be 80 inches down and it's still in uh, impacting your drainage. So it's just yeah. a matter of maybe just selecting the plants that can do well in that poor, that poorer drain, drained soil. Makes sense. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, the flower behind you is an echinacea, correct? Yeah, that's right. Cone flower. Somebody asked, and they that's wanted a to know if it was native. It is a native. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> um, Kathy, do you have any echinacea growing? Uh, Kathy, I think has everything. Yes, we growing. do. We have the purpurea. And I was going to say, if you talked about the red buckeye a lot, Janice is bringing a lot of red buckeye to the Master Gardener sale on May fifth. May 15th. So that's right. If Gainesville wants one, there's going to be red buckeye at our sale. That's absolutely right. Because I, re I remember, <laughs> I remember Janice, when she dropped them off, she's like, I, I got it figured out. I got the transplanting method figured out because <laughs> they have nice. tap roots. So making sure that you preserve that tap root when you're in transplanting, even when they're little is important. Is that right, Janice? Is that what you said is when your uh, trick <laughs> I embarrassed her. She was a fly on the wall today. <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, red buckeyes are wonderful plants. Yeah. Can we post the link to the sale in the notes from this meeting? Someone's asking. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. I'll follow up. Um, we just have a Facebook post right now, but we're going to start putting out our PSA and announcements and all that stuff this month. And we're going to, we should have a, we, we're going to have a pre-order. We should have a pre-order available where you can actually select the plants you want to buy. So we have limited contact. I know a lot of people are being vaccinated, but we still want to make sure that we're safe at the, at the event. It will be on May 15th. And the exciting thing is it's the Cuscawilla facility out there on 441, the old Camp McConnell. Someone's asking that. Yes. But we'll put a link to where it's, where it's going to happen and you know what's going to be there. Yeah, so obviously we can't grow our 5,000, 6,000 plants at our uh, little temporary office. It's just a strip center um, unit suite. But uh, since Alachua County purchased uh, Camp McConnell and now they're holding on to it, and it's uh, Cuscawilla is its name. Um, it's still not 100% open because they're doing a lot of work out there, but um, kind of like a good kickoff that we're doing for the camp is that we're going to have, they gave us a big area that we can grow all of our plants in, and it is, oh my gosh, that field is filling up. <laughs> it's exciting to see. But yeah, May 15th. So and it's Just don't uh, drive too fast along 441 because you'll miss the turning. Yeah, we'll have it clearly marked to the entrance. It's right opposite the UF Lake Warburg. Yep. <laughs> so, but yeah. Hi, this is Janice. I found out how to uh, <laughs> participate. And um, yes, my little my little red buckeyes, I cannot begin to tell you how much I love my red buckeye tree which is right outside my kitchen window. And uh, when it's not blooming, it's a light green and the sun filtering through on the west side is just stunning. And when it is blooming, I stop in the middle of my kitchen to behold the glory of this beautiful tree. <laughs> so uh, I, have, I have 30 of the babies and surprisingly, some little critter has been eating them. And I was not aware of them being a host plant for anybody, but I can tell you that there's some fat caterpillars around <laughs> that have been enjoying our red buckeyes. But I'm thinking they're gonna grow up so they'll be respectable specimens by the time of the sale. Oh man, oh, that's Colin needs one. Colin yeah, needs having one. the same yeah. deal the with the trees. Every Power. time I talk about them, every master gardener says I want one. So if any of the public out there <laughs> wants one of them, be there and be there early. Pre sale. <laughs> Taylor, um, we have a couple more questions. Yeah, let's go ahead and get to those. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, there are two related to shade and moisture, uh, suggestions for very moist area with part shade to heavy part shade and any native plant suggestions for a partly shady rain garden. Shoo. That's a multi. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> um, so suggestions for very moist area with part shade to, um, like a deeper, heavy shade. Um, what would be a good one? 
so like it goes back i like the salt bush because that one will do well in those conditions um you've got the native some, cannas right yeah the salt golden flush. canna yeah be careful Dragon's with the tail. canna that you get you need to have golden canna because there are highly invasive it's, cannas right so my son just got home <laughs> <You're playing. laughs> right. so um hold on buddy well, there was all right there's candy in the car um oh. <laughs> uh the you ate it the the flora anise yeah that'd be a good one. Oh, the anise yeah those are beautiful plants so um so partly shady rain gardens so the the part shady rain gardens yeah those rain lilies are really nice um so you can bring in some of our the the, the native grasses um and you know this let me actually show, let me pull this up because I would love to show the use on how we use this um, website or how we can use the Florida Native Plant Society's website for plant selection. Um, so let me share the screen on that one. Um, so let me get rid of that. So on the website, um, you can go to native plants and you can find uh, native landscape plants for your area. Doop, doop, doop. And uh, then you can um, go to the find plants or find your life. So find plants. And this is where you can really select those environmental conditions. So like Alachua County um, and you can select your zone. So say I lived in 8B. So I live up in High Springs area. So we're right on that line. So I'll say 8B. Um, but I want something in oh, part shade, the full shade. And they have this little neat little graph thing about periods of like moisture requirements so something that you know occasional inundation kind of like that buckeye um, usually moist but somewhat moist no flooding and then you can you can play around with this and you can select salt tolerance um, then you hit submit and then it'll pull up all, all those plants that do well in those growing conditions and the nice thing is you know this is a whole crazy list of plants um but the cheat on this website is look for the heart the heart is some of the favorited ones and those are the ones that are typically going to be the easier ones to find within nurseries so like button bush that's a beautiful one like i mentioned earlier um that is what i've someone else has called the coronavirus plant to me but i these these are beautiful plants i love these things i mean look at that flower that's a cool 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 flower so um oh man they're aromatic so play around this website but this is a great resource that you can use to uh find and look for plants um and just i don't know just be creative think about those different places in your landscape where you like to pick different plants and let this kind of start to be your guide to help help you learn about the different plants that can grow well and are considered native. So the Florida Native Plant Society. Um, so one person mentioned that they have a lot of lime limestone in their yard. So do a soil test because if you have limestone, especially about towards the surface, more than likely you're going to have a alkaline soil. So your pH is going to be a little bit higher. So be very, that's why that soil test is very important. So, but um, we do have a follow-up survey. I'm putting it in the chat box right now and I'll send this all to you all anyways um, in the email. But with all of our programs, I do this um, and it's a way to make sure that we are learning how to improve our programs um, and get feedback from you all. And also gives you an opportunity like, oh, this would be a fun topic something that we'd like to learn about as part of this lecture series and you know if we start to see a lot of trends you know that's how some of these programs get picked because we have a lot of people asking for them so um but feel free to take a few minutes to fill that out but um we'll still stay on here for a few more minutes if there's any questions but i want to thank everybody for joining us today um feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions i want to thank all of our panelists for tuning in and joining and helping answer questions you know uh Colin, Kathy, Susie, Christy, uh, Janice, um, thanks for hanging out with us. And and, uh, and add with for Janice, she's going to be talking about beekeeping very soon. That's right. That's right. Plug for Janice. Janice is a 
uh, is a beekeeper. So she's going to be putting on the program uh, all about beekeeping soon. What is that date? I don't have it off the top of my head. Uh, the 5th of May. May 5th. May 5th. Yes. And so. even if you don't want to be a beekeeper, they're just so darn much fun to talk about. You need to be there. <laughs> Pun intended, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not to do that, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for joining us um, in 